Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Health Equity and Rare Disorders. My name is Katie Kowalski, and I'm NORD's Associate Director for Education and your facilitator for this meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to share a brief announcement. Rare Disease Day, February 28th, 2022, is fast approaching. Please visit NORD's website, rarediseaseday.us, for information about events across the country. And you can also find opportunities to share your personal stories, to post your events, and even to light up your buildings in honor of Rare Disease Day. Uh, Nor will be sharing social, social media toolkits and all kinds of other resources. So please uh, visit us as we approach the big day. Today's webinar is the first uh, in a three-part series of webinars aimed at exploring disparities that rare disease patients from underserved and marginalized groups face and discussing the role that healthcare providers can play in addressing issues of health inequity. It's our privilege to be working in collaboration with the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition to produce these webinars. So we thank you, Rare Disease uh, Diversity Coalition, for your contributions and for your support. NORD has a rich history of incorporating DEI into its work, and we continue our commitment to increasing access to services and reaching diverse populations. We aim to serve the entire rare community, leaving nobody behind through the, through the provision of support, education, and research. And we also recognize that we're on a journey that has no clear endpoint. Uh, we'll need to strive continuously over time to make the rare disease space more equitable. With that, I would like to hand it off to our moderator and first presenter, Dr. Georges Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin is board certified in internal medicine, a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the executive director of the American Public Health Association. We are absolutely honored to have you here today, Dr. Benjamin, and I invite you to provide opening remarks and to introduce today's speakers. Katie, thank, thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. Um, and, and, you know, one of the real challenges we have, of course, is that we do have inequities um, in, um, in the delivery of health. And I often talk about the four things that uh, make a big difference in health. One is um, differences in access to health care. You know, we're an insurance-driven um, um, society, and so people, everyone does not have access to health care in our, in, our, in our country, and that's particularly important for people with rare diseases. Um, secondly, differences in the quality of care received within the healthcare setting. Um, even in our best um, centers, we have differences in both overuse and underuse of the appropriate healthcare um, modalities. Um, individual health seeking behaviors, uh, driven by a whole range of beliefs, access to care, uh, and a range of societal things that impact your ability to get health. And then finally, the social determinants of health. And I like to just remind folks that about 80% of what makes you healthy actually occurs outside the doctor's office. And as an ER doctor, that's, that's pretty, pretty painful revelation to admit to, but it's true. There are social determinants of those things that can get in the way and impede your ability to be healthy uh, or can help you to be healthy. It's, you know, access to um, education or transportation or um, affordable foods in your community, those kinds of things that actually um, make a big difference um, in your ability to be healthy in your community. So we're going to have a, a, a hopefully a, a, a really neat discussion today um, around a range of things um, that talk about health equity. And so with this, we have a great panel. And I want to introduce our panelists with for us today. Um, our first panelist, of course, is Michael Poku. Dr. Poku is a senior medical director at the Oak Street Health um, and Oak Street Health is, an, is, is a network of primary care centers that delivers value-based care to adults on Medicare. Mike's passionate about developing and implementing novel care models and a proponent of really whole person care, including access to novel innovative therapies um, through designing equitable access to clinical trials. Uh, secondly, um, we have um, Ms. Barbara Harrison, 
Uh, Barbara is a certified genetic counselor at Howard University um, here in Washington, D.C. She has 24 years of experience, and she's an assistant professor in teaching graduate students, medical students, and medical residents in the areas of genetics, genetic testing, genetic counseling, and ethics. She's also director of community outreach and education for the Howard University Center for Sickle Cell Disease and provides genetic counseling services at Howard University Hospital, primarily in areas of prenatal genetics. And then finally, a uh, patient advocate, um, Debbie Drell. Debbie is the director of membership at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. And in this role, she oversees NORD's membership programs, which support the collective and individual needs of rare disease patient organizations, patients, and advocates through education, research, advocacy, and mentorship. So with those introductions, um, maybe I can just start. We want to have a conversation today. Um, and so maybe I can just start with, with maybe talking with Mike. Mike, um, what do you think barriers to diagnosis and appropriate care are even greater for some of the underserved and historically marginalized communities? Yeah, and, and um, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Benjamin. Happy to be with all of you um, and such an esteemed uh, group of, of panelists and, and, a mo and moderator. Um, for me, you know, Michael Poku, primary care internist, also a trained uh, clinical informaticist. Um, I, I really look at it as a, from a lens from a primary care internist where we see across the country that there are inequities um, and health disparities that are driven by any number of things. And you, you put it so eloquently, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Benjamin, around the social determinants and social influencers of health. So like to answer your question, I see that the access to health and health care uh, in the requisite services there as a key component um, to folks' access to various clinical trials, particularly for, for folks with rare diseases. So I see the two as inextricably linked, and, and the lens that I take is let's bring the primary care internists and other stakeholders into the fold, and as we're delivering care, in figuring out how we can improve access to marginalized populations, vulnerable populations there. We're doing the same thing uh, with respect to access to clinical trials, access to these novel therapies and things of the like. Um, and in addition to the social determinants, the social influencers of health, um, you know, there's many, many reasons, right, why those who are underrepresented in healthcare are also tend to be underrepresented in clinical research. Um, so whether that's economic, um, you know, linguistic reasons, uh, structural reasons as far as access to uh, care clinics and things of that nature, transportation, uh, uh, the differences in, in culture, um, we need to be much more intentional uh, as a medical and scientific community in terms of bridging those gaps, meeting folks where they are, and being much more intentional about how we're doing uh, trial recruitment and enrollment. Um, and how we're addressing um, these things that are sort of outside the four walls of the clinic, of the uh, of the trial center, et cetera. Okay, okay. Well, I know that um, 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 we have some other thoughts. Let me um, see, Barbara, um, did you have some opening remarks? So I do um, have some comments and actually have some slides to accompany that. So thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, so I am very excited about this opportunity to be part of this discussion um, and just thankful to be welcome to the table. Uh, so my name is Barbara. I'm a genetic counselor uh, working at Howard. And I really have been at Howard for the bulk of my career. And I've really had the pleasure of serving patients who come from a variety of backgrounds, but and those backgrounds tend to be those that have generally have limited access to genetic services. And so when we think about rare disease and the fact that over 80% of rare conditions have a significant genetic component, it just becomes very clear why access to quality genetic counseling services as well as genetic testing is so important. So genetic counselors, for those who may not know, um, assist individuals and families in understanding the genetic aspects of disease and helping them through the process of genetic testing. So in addition to taking family histories and collecting medical information, genetic counselors help families really understand genetics 
review the limitations and pros and cons of testing, and discuss how genetic information may affect one from a psychological and social standpoint. Um, as, and in that process, incorporating cultural, spiritual, and personal beliefs to help people make the best decisions for them in regards to genetic testing, as well as navigate through the options of management once those genetic testing results are received. And so having adequate access to genetic testing can really expedite the diagnostic odyssey that many families affected with rare disease experience and can facilitate appropriate healthcare management. However, we know that access to services um, is not equal and is not equitable in our society. In addition to um, some families facing being underinsured or uninsured, um, there's often just a lack of knowledge about what genetic services are about or how they can be beneficial. And then this is, can be compounded by the fact that there's a limited number of you know, formerly trained genetic professionals. And when we look at that limited workforce, the diversity in terms of culture and ethnicity is extremely limited. And so, and often don't represent these communities that are, you know, subsequently underserved. Next slide. And so unfortunately, this lack of diversity among clinical professionals, genetic professionals is also mirrored when we look at genetic research. So when we think about personalized medicine and wanting, you know, us to be able to take advantage of the benefits of that of personalized medicine, it really comes down to understanding the biologic and often genetic basis of disease so that it can be treated effectively. Now, the answers we're looking for as far as this genetic cause of disease really could be anywhere among the genome. And there's literally millions of mutations or variations in the genome that could be causative. But in order for us to identify those specific variations, we do genetic studies and look for changes in genes that are seen in people with and without a disease of interest. So these genome-wide association studies are designed to identify relationships between a person's genetic makeup, or what we say genotype, and then their phenotype, or how they look, the symptoms they have, and so forth. Now, what you see here in this on this slide is on the left is a graph. And it's basically depicting the fact that almost 80% of individuals that have been included in GWAS studies or these genome-wide association studies, 80% um, of these individuals have been of Northern European descent. Although when we look globally, only or really less than 9% of people in a global population are Northern European. So this means that we're really missing knowledge on the vast array and the majority of genetic diversity. And so we've spent most of our time and dollars researching only a small percentage of our population for these genetic changes. And if we continue down this road of just studying these same populations, it's really analogous to a man searching for keys that he's lost on his way home. That key could be anywhere, but he may just focus on where that light is shining because that's what he can see. And he's kind of ignoring the dark around him. And so similarly, the key to some of the diseases that we're trying to identify and address really could be in that, um, that dark area. It's not in the light and what's been shown on as far as those European dominant genomes, but rather it's kind of in the, var the variation that we're looking for is in the dark because we haven't spent the money, we haven't done the research to engage communities so that we can get to that genetic diversity. And so this bias effectively translates into less informative genetic testing poor disease prediction, and really suboptimal treatment for individuals um, of underrepresented ancestries and limits our scope of knowledge overall. So there are definitely efforts to change this narrative, but we have a lot of ground we need to make up, and it's really not going to happen overnight. There's a significant level of distrust in communities of color and other marginalized populations. And this is for very good reasons. There's been past abuses rooted in institutional racism, eugenics, and discrimination that have led to a collective consciousness among many communities that the medical system is just not designed for their good or for their health. Next slide. 
So one example of how this collective consciousness um, of distress has come about is when we look at the example of sickle cell, which of course is very near and dear to me given my position um, at Howard and just personally. So sickle cell disease is a genetic condition that due to the transatlantic slave trade predominantly affects individuals of African descent in the United States. Now, globally, it affects people of many different ethnicities, but when we look at the United States, it is predominantly individuals of African descent. And so in many ways, over time, this has been labeled as a Black disease. And its history in regard to disease management and treatment in this country is really wrought with those inequities, um, with overt and covert discrimination and significant racial bias. And so there's real consequences to that. And this is exemplified in this table here, which is from a paper um, that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it really demonstrated this clear disparity in funding for sickle cell disease. So what the authors did was they compared um, federal and private foundation spending for sickle cell disease versus cystic fibrosis. Now, cystic fibrosis is similarly a genetic condition, but it's found predominantly, again, in the, in the U.S. and individuals of Northern European descent. And so keeping in mind that there's over three times more people with sickle cell disease than cystic fibrosis in our population, this paper actually documented the fact that the NIH granted four times more money per person with cystic fibrosis than they did for the person for sickle cell disease. So four times more money. And that disparity is even greater when you look at um, private foundation money and spending. And so, you know, this does have a trickle down effect. It, it limits what we know about a different, about conditions when we don't have that granting money there. And then one very key point that's also demonstrated in this table at the bottom is the fact that during the time period, this 10 year time period that this study covered, there were um, only four um, I'm sorry, only three drugs that were identified to treat sickle cell disease, but in the same time frame, there were 15 drugs that were developed to treat CF. And so this lack of funding really has these clear implications later down. So my last slide. Um, so I just wanted to use this um, opportunity to, you know, to point out that this lack of funding, this type of disparity in treatment of diseases really does have um, significant consequences for individuals with disease. Um, in the realm of sickle cell disease, um, there are there were 10 federally funded sickle cell disease centers that provided really great care. They started in 1972 um, with the National Sickle Cell Control Act, but in 2008, that funding was stopped. And so those centers closed. And so this really has left very spotty care for individuals with sickle cell. Existing centers are really spread out throughout the nation and really aren't, um, don't have to follow certain standards for care. Um, they're really understaffed, they're underfunded. And this leads to individuals with sickle cell having to depend on the ER for care, not really getting the correct management that they need for their disease. And then when they go to these places that aren't really familiar with the disease, they're met with um, very, you know, discriminatory behavior and things that maybe we can get to, you know, later on today. But there has been, again, some acknowledgement of these disparities. These efforts have gone to, you know, try to give more money to sickle cell disease, but often that's, well, that seems to be more so focused on things like gene therapy and other treatments that not everybody with sickle cell disease can really even access because they're not really even accessing the healthcare system well. So, with that, um, I'm going to stop. Um, I definitely look forward to further discussion about these issues, you know, how we can get to some solutions around them. Um, but with that, I will stop. Thank you so much. Barbara, Barbara thank you very much. Um, let me go on to, uh, to Debbie um, and hear some of her thoughts. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. I'm Debbie Drell, Nord's Director of Membership. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a second generation Mexican American with both parents born in Mexico. Uh, I've been working at Nord for five years directly with 1,200 nonprofit organizations and hundreds of rare disease 
nonprofit leaders. So my perspective on health equity will be um, the role of patient nonprofit organizations in addressing uh, health equity for rare diseases. Prior to working at Nord, I worked for 13 and a half years at the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. And as a Latinx, and especially as a Mexican American, I love telling stories. So forgive me for going a little long. I'm gonna tell a couple of stories uh, just in my brief introduction on this subject. So first, um, my sister. Uh, for 22 years, I have been caregiving um, financially, emotionally, and in other ways for my sister, my big sister, who was diagnosed with a rare life-threatening heart and lung disease called pulmonary hypertension. And when she was diagnosed, it was almost too late for her. It was 1998, and she was 28 years old, living in a very rural town in Texas. She faced gender and ethnic discrimination. As a young Mexican-American woman, she saw 12 different doctors and was on the verge of death before they finally diagnosed her. Uh, lose weight. It's in your head. Take psychiatric medications. They prescribed her when she was having grand mal seizures. Uh, she knew something was awry. Ah, that's her on the left at a patient-focused drug development meeting. And that's both of us in Washington, D.C. in the before times at a Nord fundraiser. Uh, and I'm so grateful I can do advocacy work in her name and for all of those. But doctors told her so many things. As a young woman, they didn't take her seriously. And as a young mom, uh, they thought it was everything else. They, and this is not just, um, you know, it's, it's common to rare diseases. Uh, she was very lucky, even though she had limited access to care. Um, a lot of people get diagnosed in autopsy for pulmonary hypertension, even though there are 17 treatments. Treatments does not necessarily mean hope. Well, access is very important. After working at the PH Association for 13 years, I learned that her story uh, is not uncommon. The disease of pulmonary hypertension primarily affects women in their childbearing age. So uh, a lot of women get told a lot of things um, and they, uh, the physicians don't necessarily think of um, other underlying causes. So our family is one of 25 million Americans. If you're living with a rare disease, your story will vary, but Nord and nonprofit organizations, um, including 330 members of Nord and a total of 1,200 that we know of uh, in the field, we're working in a unified goal for early and accurate diagnosis and support, the best clinical care, better outcomes, treatments, and for some who seek them, cures for everyone affected by rare diseases. So we heard a little bit about the represent representation of um, different diverse populations in studies, genetic studies. Uh, FDA did a snapshot of participants of drug trials, and it doesn't look good, it doesn't look diverse, uh, and it looks very similar to what we had just seen before that Barbara had mentioned in terms of the um, ethnic breakdown. 76% of all clinical trials um, in, their, in this report from 2015 to 2019, 76% were white. Well, it's not a white country. Um, surprising to say, and maybe it sounds shocking to say, but uh, in 20 years, the census data and census anal analysts say that the U.S. will become a majority minority country. By data standards, that means that less than 50% of the population will consist of non-Hispanic whites. So we have 50% that it will be uh, white, and then the rest will be a diverse array of different ethnic populations but our clinical trials do not demonstrate that. What is the immediate impact or what is what is the possible impact of a non-diverse study? Well, clinical trials help us develop treatments and devices. And in the pandemic, we know that there are already, you know, a disproportionate number of uh, communities of color that are impacted, um, that are dying of COVID. Well, what is, how do clinical trials and medical system also demonstrate the impact um, of, of where you live and uh, your ethnicity for COVID? Uh, pulse oximeter trials probably look like this pie chart, 70% white, maybe 78% uh, white on this pie chart. But uh, for trials done on devices, you know, this trend is common that the clinical trials participants are not uh, diverse. Well, pulse oximeters, um, you put them on your thumb, they tell you what your blood uh, saturation level is and your oxygen, and it tracks uh, 
any drops that are significant that would require urgent medical response. And these devices work by passing light through the blood. Skin pigmentation could have a bearing on how light is absorbed. So if you have a predominantly white participation group in your clinical trial, um, this is going to have a negative impact on those who are not white using these devices. And medical experts around the world have said pulse oximeters became to COVID-19 what the thermometer is to a viral fever. So COVID causes severe breathing problems. Oximeters were vital for detecting blood oxygen level drops. And researchers shown that people with darker skin, that it just doesn't work, that it overstates the level of oxygen. So essentially the device failed to report drops in oxygen for people from different ethnic groups. And the United Kingdom is now doing a huge investigation. This was big in the news uh, right after Thanksgiving. So late in November, not too long ago, the UK plans on partnering with the US Health and, Hu Health and Human Services, our HHS, to look at this. Um, more research needs to be done, but experts say that there is a huge possibility that um, pulse oximeters, uh, that this discrepancy is, has led to thousands of, of avoidable deaths during the pandemic. So direct impact is death, that it's a life and death situation, that clinical trial diversity could have saved lives. Uh, and in fact, it was the opposite. So for nonprofit organizations um, in rare diseases, the rare diseases are marginalized communities. They're small populations. No one cares about rare diseases unless they're directly impacted by rare diseases. If you're a nonprofit leader working on um, one specific rare disease, you're probably the only one doing the work as patient advocates. And they're defined as less than 200,000. Some diseases have fewer than 100 patients and they're further divided by unique genetic mutations. We know that 95% of rare diseases have zero treatments. So clinical trials are probably the only way for the majority of rare disease patients to access uh, investigational therapies. It's the only hope for so many rare disease patients. And nonprofit organizations fuel research. They're involved as, as scientific citizens who are involved in clinical trial design, funding clinical trials. Uh, they're Nonprofit organizations are doing everything they can to accelerate diagnosis, which it takes seven to 12 years. So uh, doctors struggle to diagnose these cases because they're rare. They've never seen anything like this before. They're not in the medical textbooks. It takes a long time to identify. And clinical trials, um, like we said before, you know, they're closing down. In, they're only in, you know, majority of them, the sites are in major cities, high populations and where there's academic institutions doesn't attract the rural population, people in central parts of the country. So another quick story, I'm gonna check time. Another quick story is um, that when I, and working at Nord, I've heard stories of parents of children with great cognitive and physical debilitating diseases where they had to move thousands of miles away from home to get treatments for their children living with rare life-threatening diseases. And it was shocking to hear the lengths that these parents go to get care for their kids. They had to switch jobs. They had to work two jobs. They had to sell their homes. They had to move to another state. One parent had to stay behind with a bunch of kids and the other parent had to go and move for six months to access clinical trials. It takes a lot of resources, health literacy to navigate all of that, privilege. Who can uproot their entire lives? So when I think about it from my family's perspective, my mom is first generation immigrant who learned English by watching Sesame Street was a single mom raising seven kids with little money, no strong family support system, no resources to allocate her family. If any one of me or my brothers or sisters got a rare disease that would require us to move to another part of the country, my mom would have to make a decision that, that we might have to die because she had, would have no way. I can't imagine what she would do or the choices she would have to make for the other six kids versus taking care of one child. And that's just a story um, but immigration challenges, medical literacy, language barriers, financial resources, lack of syst a family system to help, uh, this is really a huge issue. So for rare diseases, uh, we can't live on a one-size-fits-all. Um, there's so much more to the rare disease story. So um, I'll just wrap up with one or two more slides just to elucidate health literacy issues. Like I mentioned, it's people's ability to not just absorb and, and uh, understand information, um, it's to use it, to navigate it. 
Uh, it's the ability to make well-informed decisions rather than what we think are appropriate because cultural differences and cultural lenses may change an individual's decision. And we don't know what is right. We only know, uh, you know what we know in terms of the diseases themselves. And organizations, nonprofits, institutions, clinicians and researchers uh, have an obligation to address health literacy as well. So this uh, cartoon is hilarious to me I don't like the adversarial nature of it, but I do believe that, you know, the system sometimes pits uh, physicians and, and patients in separate corners where patient experiences are not as valued and patients don't understand that physicians aren't taught rare diseases. We want both physicians and patients to speak to each other and to understand that this is not easy and that the patient perspective is valued and that, the, and that physicians are doing all that they can when they're learning about rare diseases. Um, and then this one I really like, uh, focusing on um, pulmonary hypertension. Actually, Leslie Pulse is a cartoonist with pulmonary hypertension. And, um, you know, the good news is, the bad news is you have a progressive and fatal disease. The good news is it's better to get it now than five years ago. Um, health literacy is empathy. And if we're talking about health equity, Patients don't necessarily, depending on their experiences, trust the medical system. You get a, a surprise bill, uh, you're overwhelmed by navigating insurance, and then your physician talks to you in a way that, that doesn't necessarily speak to the, the fear and anxiety around the experience. So I think it's tough uh, for patients um, and also for physicians to learning about how to work together collaboratively. Nonprofit organizations do education and research. And um, I'm going to stop there because there's so much to, to share about diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity with rare diseases. But um, I know we have a, a whole panel and lots of questions, so I will stop there. Thank you for letting me share um, a little bit about the rare disease experience from a patient nonprofit experience. Debbie, thank you very, very much. Um, let, let me go to Michael and see if Michael has something he wants to add in kind of the broader context of on what our other two speakers have had to say. No, I mean, I think the um, the comments has been fantastic, right? Because I, I think folks are capturing it well um, in that the disparities exist. How do we think about some of the cultural barriers, the health literacy, health numeracy barriers? Um, and then as stakeholders, right, um, when we, we think about all the different stakeholders, I think the big question that I have, which we'd love to get others' thoughts on, is how do we think about partnering um, and getting like-minded individuals and like-minded entities to have that synergistic effect. Because I think a lot of folks are thinking about this and wanting to drive, but at least what I see is a lot of folks moving in a silo type format. So it'd be great to get other thoughts um, uh, on terms of how can we best work together in a more synergistic way, because I think that's the way forward. And just hearing some of the other panelists, it just gets me so jazzed and, and energized. And you know, on the other side of this, I'm trying to think through more, more partnerships, um, you know, more organizations that, that I need to get familiar with and, and that we need to partner with and, and, and things of that nature. And, and, you know, Michael, you're right about that. And I think that brings um, um, to light the fact that, uh, again, these are rare diseases. Um, these are things that, I, I, you know, I, we certainly learned about them, at least the physician component, learned about them in medical school. Sure. Um, but, you know, we may have had 10-minute lecture on it, and, the, and many of us have never seen these cases before. So I guess that brings out the importance of putting this together and addressing this in a more collaborative way. Um, so, um, Barbara, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, obviously, you're counseling people all the time. How do you deal with this when you're dealing with the disease that, that um, quite frankly, the, the average clinician may not have a, a good concept of? Uh, and then let me ask um, Debbie to you know, build on that after you've commented on, uh, from an advocacy perspective, how do, we, how do we build more awareness just broadly in the, in the population? So thank you so much for, um, for that question. Yeah, you know, I work at a medical school um, and it still it's, it astounds me the the amount of information that physicians are expected to process and you know and work through and you know the 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 knowledge that we have it's just impossible 
for one person to have the full level of expertise to be able to deal with every patient who walks in. And so I think it just comes with humility on both sides, you know, for that the, the clinician to understand, I don't know everything. I need to educate myself when I'm faced with, you know, something that I don't know and being just honest about that. Um, and then I think it also is from the, the, patient side, who I think we should not put as many expectations on to educate people about their disease. However, because of organizations like NORD and because of patient advocacy organizations, there are, you know, individuals with these conditions that are willing to educate. Um, and so I think it's about, I, I agree very much with Mike, it's about bringing us all to the same table, because when we're not all at the same table, then it starts to become that adversarial relationship, you know, and I see that all the time um, in sickle cell. And then when we talk about, you know, unconscious bias and, you know, behaviors that just are not becoming of any clinician, um, but seep into our, our, but are there and they seep in there and, and that, and it comes out and it affects our, our patients every day. So it's about also clinicians really being aware of those biases, being willing to go through that training, um, you know, and recognize that at the table so that we can come together, you know, and really synergize, like you said, like kind of come together and try to identify what are our common goals and what are we trying to achieve here and how can we get to the best care for our patients you know, get through those issues around transportation, around language barriers, not not even language barriers, even using that term, but, you know, working around how we can get information to patients that they can understand and process and take advantage of um, and taking ownership of that as clinicians. And I'd love to add to that um, just an example from one of our member organizations um, and, and actually, all of our member organizations, the majority of them have medical advisory boards. And so they work on these collaborations with their own medical leaders to create programs. The Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research has this campaign called Ignore No More. The, it's the first of its kind national African-American women in sarcoidosis campaign because African-American women are three times more likely to develop sarcoidosis compared to Caucasians. Their hospitalization rates are 18 times higher than Caucasian men. Their mortality rate is 13 times higher than that of Caucasians and 1.5 times higher than African-American men. And the campaign is to raise awareness, identify barriers. They have a patient advisory committee of women of color and a clinical advisory committee of women of color with four practicing clinicians and an epidemiologist. Ultimately, I believe that patient nonprofit organizations are a great place to bring together both the clinical experts and the patient communities and have those conversations as to how do we, what are the bridge, what are the um, uh, disparities, who is left out at the table for um, access to care and how do we build these bridges? And a lot of it yeah. is awareness raising, educational campaigns, individual patient empowerment campaigns. Some of it's just teaching patients how to collect their medical records and to maximize their time in the clinical setting. You know, you have 15 minutes with your doctor, how to take advantage of uh, nurse practitioners and other allied healthcare professionals. So there's a lot that nonprofit organizations can do to prepare patients. Something that was learned at Pulmonary Hypertension Association is that patients coming into their doctor's office with brochures doesn't always work. Physicians would rather hear and get medical information from their peers. And that was something that was learned in a three-year campaign for early diagnosis because patients have had, in that experience, uh, had a lot of anger because of their misdiagnosis. So I think it's important to really check in on both the patient community and the medical professionals with strategies that are humble, open, forgiving, and supportive of, um, of honest and safe uh, education and awareness. You know, one of the things that um, happens, particularly with um, rare diseases, is trying to get people into clinical trials. And um, Barbara, you talked a great deal about the disparity that's in that. Um, Michael, what, what's the, um, you know, issues around trying to get more um, people, particularly communities of color, involved into clinical trials? Um, Barbara talked about the distrust, but what are some of the ideas from a clinical perspective? Yeah, so the, the, certainly the, the, the mistrust, the distrust is, is a real barrier, right? Um, and not unfounded, as we all know, in Tuskegee and other things. 
Um, but there's also, you know, disparities in terms of, you know, a lot of these clinical trials, particularly for, for rare diseases, are sort of focused in and around large academic centers. Um, and if you have, uh, you know, folks underrepresented in terms of getting their care at those at large academic centers, you're going to have a consequent uh, underrepresentation of that same population in the subsequent clinical trial. Um, so it really is, uh, at least from, from, from what I've seen and some experiences, like really reaching out into the community um, and pulling through um, and some of the great stuff that, you know, Debbie mentioned as far as having that synergistic effect and impact and bringing folks together in an advocacy basis. Um, and one of the things that we've seen with COVID, for instance, is the ability to really tap into technology and to really deliver care um, in a virtualized context um, and using that virtual medium. Um, and the same thing goes for virtualized trials, like whether it's uh, trials that are completely virtual or have some sort of hybrid component. Um, anything that we can do to decrease the barriers um, uh, to make this stuff a little bit easier, whether that's providing transportation, doing virtualized and hybridized trials, um, reaching out to the community, um, getting in touch with those primary care providers, who are going to have a much better relationship with the, those patients um, than somebody at arm's length trying to convince them that, oh, like you're, you're eligible for this trial, this trial, this other trial. So um, I, I think those are just a handful of things, but I, I, I've been somewhat uh, optimistic in the midst of all the craziness with the pandemic that you know, we've shown that we can use technology effectively uh, to positively impact the care that we're delivering and, and the, the, the trial enrollments and things of that nature for folks with rare uh, disease. How, how about a similar um, issue around making sure that we can get people with rare diseases into state-of-the-art care? Again, if you're a clinician and you're not even familiar with the diseases, how could you possibly be even knowledgeable about state-of-the-art care? Um, you know, let me, let me ask uh, Barbara to talk about that from a sickle cell perspective and then Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, Debbie, you can talk about that from the pulmonary hypertension perspective, because those are both two diseases. They're um, certainly things I learned in medical school, um, and I've actually seen cases of, of both of those diseases. But, you know, the therapies um, for those two diseases are dramatically changed from when I went to medical school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um... Absolutely. I think this is something that we're really seeing come true in the in the sickle cell community. So there's been, you know, a lot of attention on gene therapy and the promises of that to provide cures for conditions like sickle cell. But when you really talk to the community of people, you talk to patients that have sickle cell, they yes, you know, they want a cure, but they just want care. And I think it goes to what you said. They just want to, you know, just this week, where am I going to get my care from? You know, how can I avoid um, that pain crisis that might be coming down the line? And so I think there, there's been this movement toward what's called community-based research. And so it's basically really engaging the community from the very beginning, if you're doing a clinical trial or doing any kind of research, to go to that community and engage them from the very beginning when you're just starting to ask that research question, even when you're trying to figure out what your research question is going to be, and engaging them at that point so that you're not only you know, maybe getting to a, an outcome that you're thinking is important, but you're also identifying and reaching outcomes that they think is important as well. Because that's how you're really going to engage individuals into what you're trying to do. And that's how it's going to have the most impact. So, um, so to your question, I think it just really comes to um, allowing people to really kind of um, have a part in their destiny. You know, really, again, bring those folks to the same table in a respectful manner um, to identify, okay, if you do do this trial, what are the barriers that are there? I'm not going to be able to come to a clinic every day. I'm not going to be able to come to a clinic every other day to, you know, have you measure whatever. So what other, you know, alternatives do we have here? And then that's how you're really going to increase that engagement. Um, but I think that's really critical, whether it's with sickle cell or, you know, any other kind of rare disease that we start to really engage these individuals into the conversation. Debbie, similar thought about pulmonary hypertension. 
Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, a, a pulmonary hypertension in terms of, you know, how, how do we get more people to, um, um, to engage in that and, um, you know, from the patient's perspective? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about just all rare diseases from a nonprofit organization perspective. Um, NORD just launched a Centers of Excellence program early in November, and it brings together clinical experts nationally across um, rural states. Uh, we have Alabama, Georgia, um, southern states, Midwest, Nebraska, Utah, all around the country to be able to bring uh, specialized care from with high standards vetted for um, cutting across multiple rare diseases. And it is the next big stride for being able to enable access. And NORD has this Centers of Excellence program, but we know of other uh, rare disease nonprofits that are doing their own Centers of Excellence. And ultimately the goal is to make the best care, specialty care, more accessible to the community. Um, also NORD is doing advocacy that uh, Dr. Park mentioned on uh, telehealth to make sure that when the pandemic is over, that we're still allowing access to telehealth for our communities because no, most people can't afford to fly a thousand or 3000 miles to, to another coast or to a major city and um, don't have the time to be able to go to specific appointments and with um, medical burden and devices and um, uh, having your family, having to pick up and move, you know, these are real challenges to clinical trial participation that telehealth can bridge. Yeah. And then what I'd say, right, because I agree with those points for sure, from a medical education perspective, I think there's another big piece here um, that we're really seeing a bit of a, a Flexner, Flexner Report style movement in medical education to where, uh, George, and you said it well a little earlier, that, you know, when I was in medical school, I was taught very explicitly that half of what you're learning right now in a couple of years is going to be untrue. Right, because the pace at which we are learning and, the, and we're we're seeing advancements, that medical school and medical medical education um, should and can it, it has been moving away from learn everything. Here's a textbook. Learn all this stuff. This is information. To here's how you recognize patterns. Um, here's how you think about uh, uh, biases, pattern recognition, um, and how to and how to solve problems. And then, yes, you need to know pathophysiology, but things are changing so rapidly that the memorization for memorization's sake doesn't serve patients and serve society, right? So it's much more around absolutely, like if you hear health beats, like think horses, not zebras, but we also need to understand when to actually think about zebras um, and when to raise, the, raise your hand for help and how to get that help. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a big component of what we'll continue to see, even though, right, like thinking about how we were educating folks, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it's a bit of a, of a cultural shift. Um, so you don't need to know everything. You need to know how to think about problems, where to go to get solutions and answers, and when to pull in additional expertise. When, you know, um, obviously, um, Pharmaceuticals play a big role here, and particularly with many of these diseases, particularly as we learn more. What, what can the role can the uh, pharmaceutical industry play in, in mitigating these disparities for people in rare diseases? Because clearly, you know, one of the big issues is, is cost. I would say they can obviously yeah. make their right. drugs affordable. Let's start with, I'll take the easy one. <laughs> Well, you know, and I'll add that, you know, we, we shown the graphs, you know, who has been involved in the development of those pharmaceuticals? How do we make that better? Um, and so I think it does, it, it has to be intentional, you know, increasing the diversity of who you are inviting, who you are sponsoring, what researchers you're bringing to the table, all that has to be intentional if your goal is to, you know, is to diversify, to bring in different perspectives. And we know that excellence requires that diversity of thought. It just does. So, you know, as much as pharmaceutical companies are going to point to them specifically, can engage professionals from diverse backgrounds, from diverse um, perspectives to the table to think about how to um, both develop their 
drugs, but then also how to get them, you know, out to the people. Um, so I would just say it, it just has to be intentional and in bringing those folks to the table. Yeah. And I, I'd say like from a trial perspective, like trial sponsors need to need to go to ground, right? They need to, they need to really understand what are the barriers that the patients I'm trying to targeting face on a day-to-day basis when you think about social determinants, social influencers of health, environmental influencers, and how do we as sponsors help to overcome said barriers? And I think that's a relatively big shift in a way a lot of sponsors have been thinking, right? Because we, we've we been, um, you know, sponsors always said, you know, speed, speed, speed. It's always been how fast can I sort of yeah. complete this? And it needs to move towards the richness and not how yeah. fast, how rich can I get this? How representative can I get this? And how do I help and serve, uh, you know, those patients, those those individuals that I'm ultimately trying to develop new technologies, new pharmaceuticals for? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, and just at, oh, just no, quickly ahead. to add, because that engagement takes time. It's, it is, it's a paradigm shift. It's yeah. not, I'm giving you, you know, a million dollars, but spend it in a year and make it happen. It's, you know, I give you a million dollars and I know you need three or four years because you're going to have to get in, build relationships to the people in this community so that you can build that trust. So then we can get to this outcome that we all want. Well, you know, this is an exciting topic and I, I know we could probably do this, talk about this, this area all day. I'm going to ask each of you as we close out to give me one thing that if you could if you could simply do one thing that you think would make the biggest advance um, in addressing disparities in people with rare diseases, um, what would that be? And I know they've got four or five of them. But I'm only going to let you get one. What would it be? Michael, let me start with you. Yeah, so, I mean, and again, I've got a couple in my head. I'd say the one thing that I would do would be to democratize expertise. Um, And by that, I mean, you know, we are now clearly in a place where we can tap into world expertise um, in a matter of minutes. So how do we democratize that over the country, whether you be in a rural area, whether you're you're a dense uh, urban area, to say, hey, I know I have X problem, X issue, uh, and I'm, th- this is a rare condition that I've not ever seen before, maybe second year of med school. I can't put my finger on it. How do I tap into world experts that way? Again, we have the technological expertise. We certainly have the brain power uh, in the United States. It's just putting all the different pieces together um, to make that happen in an equitable manner. Uh, I'll have to, um, I guess, just piggyback on that. I think Mike said it um, said it very well, because um, I think it's about tapping into those different people who may have that expertise, really empowering our individuals who have these rare diseases that they are as experts as well, and you know, and deserve a seat at that table as much as you know the clinician does or the researcher does. Um, and as, as Mike was saying, you know, take advantage of the technology that we've all, you know, were kind of baptism by fire to learn about and learn how effectively that we can use these virtual ways of communication to, to help bring all those folks to the table. You know, before it was just a practical issue. Now that's starting to get removed and now we can really um, start to engage. So I think it's just about empowering communities to understand what their power is. Um, and in addition to that, also clinicians. Um, you know, I think sometimes clinicians feel like I'm not the expert. You know, what can I do? But they really are critical to delivering care letting people know about what clinical trials are out there. Um, and so we really need to engage them as well, those general practitioners. Thank you. And Debbie? I'll, I'll jump in and share a slide um, just to show that nonprofit organizations have leaders ranging from a board of directors to med- medical advisors and staff leaders and the community. And they are, nonprofit organizations are a safe space, they're trusted, they're patient driven, they are the voice of rare diseases, but they have to look internally to see what their unconscious biases are and to understand that if they truly wanna affect everyone impacted by their rare disease, that they have to look critically internally at their own leadership, at the diversity or lack of diversity in their 
uh, staffing and their leaders, their board, and have to really allocate time and resources to evaluating their own representation, looking at how they're communicating their mission and their resources, who's accessing those resources, and really having true heart-to-hearts amongst themselves um, in order for them to have their resources truly utilized by those that are impacted by the rare diseases. So the Sarcoidosis uh, Research Foundation is an example of when the community is not accessing and needs care, programs have to change and adapt to reach those communities that are disproportionately impacted. So I would say an internal evaluation and real conversations and allocating funding so you're not in a one-size-fits-all uh, rare disease uh, communication and a strategy. Well, listen, I'm going to thank you. Um, and I would love to thank our panelists and just remind everyone, this is a part of a three-part series for the National Organization for Rare um, Dis Disorders uh, in collaboration with the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition. And I believe the next um, webinar will be in February of 2022. So I encourage all of you to um, to look out for that one. I think that would be another exciting presentation. With that, I want to thank you all um, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, thank folks. you.